John, John, John grew up in the Meadowlands, which is where he learned to love the natural world. And he has recently published a book of his, um, of his I think it's, a, it's your blog, Don? Um, yeah, Meadowlands he's had, blog. He's yeah. had a blog and it's been on Facebook for a long time called My Life in the Meadowlands. And he's recently published it as a book. Um, and it's, um, it's just great stuff about the Meadowlands. Um, Don has um, the, um, he's worked for Wild Birds Unlimited in Paramus up here for quite a long time as a store naturalist and designed over 500 backyard wildlife habitats. Um, the Bergen Audubon is extremely, um, um, it, it, it has a great presence up here and it's extremely important for promoting native plants. They have realized that if you have native plants, you have birds, which I think not all Audubon folks do, frankly. And, um, and they have um, a program where you can get your garden certified as a, um, as a wildlife habitat through Bergen Audubon. Um, they run all kinds of programs. Um, they're gonna have a birding day in the Meadowlands on May 10th. Um, they're all, and there's another one in the fall every year, lots and lots of stuff going on. They they have three um, native plant gardens that they maintain, that they planted and maintained. They do all kinds of educational programs with scouts and with schools. Um, so as I said, it is my very great pleasure to introduce him and to hear his talk about um, getting, developing a certified wildlife habitat, habitat in your own backyard. Thank you, John. Hey, thank you, Elaine. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I got to say, it's, it's been a great day. Um, Watching, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Talome and and uh, every all the other great speakers, we've come such a long way uh, with with the recognition of native plants over the last twenty years. I mean, you know, back in the day, uh, we started talking about native plants. You were a little weird, at least I was. You know, you were a little eccentric, but it, it's gone so much more mainstream now. That I think it's incredible, and as you'll see. Uh, as, as you probably already know, how important it is to the survival of, of all our wildlife. And yes, uh, we're the local chapter of National Audubon Society. And uh, even though, uh, and we're all volunteer organization, by the way. And even though we're called uh, Bergen County Audubon Society, our jurisdiction now is all Passaic County, Hudson County, uh, and some uh, uh, Essex County and some of Morris County now. So uh, we had our 80th anniversary last year. So we thought it was like too late to change our name now. So let's go. Ahead. So thank you. So we'll get going. Uh, so oops, I'm back there. All right. Uh, so creating a, a Burn County Water certified wildlife garden. Uh, and and let's we'll talk a little bit how why this got started because we know we know living in in New Jersey uh, and not only Jersey now how how we have to realize how important every backyard is you know we kind of thought of of uh, of the natural world of the environment maybe in parks and state forests but they weren't really in our in our backyard but. Uh, and, you know, I got to say, if, if some of the stuff that we did, that we do do to our backyards, we did to local nature centers, uh, we would be out there with all kinds of protest signs and everything would tolerate it. But now we really have to understand uh, that our backyard is just as much part of that ecosystem, uh, just as much part of survival for wildlife as it is for any state forest or county park or whatever. So, so why did we come to the realization to start this program? Well, you know what? We always knew that, uh, uh, at least in, in our organization, how important uh, our backyards were. But back, back a few years ago, um, one of our, our, our education uh, director, Marie, uh, uh, well, let me, I'm going a little backwards first. Uh, one of our, our volunteers, uh, Jimmy Macaluso, was tagging monarch butterflies in, in Palisades Park uh, to track the migration of monarchs. Well, a few days later, some of those butterflies showed up in our education director, uh, Marie Longo's backyard in Hackensack. So we it just brought it home to, okay, so where did the butterflies go in between those towns? Were there enough habitat? And what if Marie's habitat wasn't there? Would the butterflies survive? And then we really understood that we really had had to do something to bring this whole uh, concept forward of, of having backyard certified. And, and recently, uh, some good news that one of uh, Marie's tagged monarch butterflies 
uh, was uh, at last season was uh, spotted in Cape May. So uh, very important. And that really, you really don't find those. It's rare to find uh, the tagged butterflies, but there you go. So it's pretty exciting. But one of the great birds, uh, you know, growing up, you know, that uh, I came to love and we all love it, it the wood thrush, uh, the most beautiful song in the forest that we've been hearing, unfortunately, less and less over time. And um, a little bit of the wood thrush story of bring home how important uh, our habitats and native plants and, and backyards are. And so that's what's going, that's the difference. That's what's happening to our, our landscape, becoming more fragmented. Um, and that's unfortunately a graph on how much the wood thrush uh, has been declining over the years. 55% uh, decline over the past 50 years, 41% uh, of all neotropical migratory birds are in decline. And um, so 54% of U.S. has now developed as, as suburban or urban areas. And, and so, and, and you know, if living in New Jersey, and I don't care where you are in New Jersey now, whether in more rural counties, we see this happening everywhere. And of course, to top that off, if that's not bad enough that all these areas are being developed, we're using all non-native plants in those areas for the most part. And a housing density map uh, that you'll see, and that's how much by 2030, just go backwards a little bit, and that's where, that's unfortunately where, where we're headed. And so uh, Audubon's last study, that's since 1970, unfortunately, we lost 2.9 billion birds. So it's time to us to rethink uh, what we are, are are doing to our backyards and schoolyards and and everywhere, and I don't want to I don't want this to sound negative really because we we can do this, you know we're doing it with monarch butterflies right, so, you know we always thought that if we couldn't bring back the Midwest as monarch habitat. Uh, then, then we were just going to lose the monarch, but now we understand that the population is hanging on because of butterfly gardens that we're creating, uh, 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 habitats that individual groups are, are uh, um, maintaining and improving. So this is really a grassroots effort uh, and this should be really empowering really to everybody. And you know, no, no better, uh, better example than New Jersey, how everything's become fragmented. It's really a quilt work of habitats is what we have. Um, and so uh, the idea of the program is to create those stepping stones. So here, if you're from this area, you want to connect the Meadowlands with, um, with Tina Creek, or you want to connect it with uh, uh, any state forest, we, we have to create those stepping stones. We can't go buying up property, I wish we can, and create all forests and knock down the houses. But what we can do is add to the biodiversity of native plants, but between all those habitats and connect in the best way we can those, those fragmented habitats. And you know what? We talk about climate change, um, which, you know, it, it's, it's tough. It's not an easy thing to talk about uh, because sometimes you just lose people and it seems nothing you could see and touch for the most part. But we can do something about this too. The way we want to uh, relieve stresses for migratory birds uh, relief stresses from pollinators and butterflies is to create these backyard wildlife habitats. And ultimately, look, it creates a better place for you and I, a healthy habitat for us to live in at the same place. So we have about 175 certified yards, schoolyard businesses, and we're even into Pennsylvania, New York State, Missouri now. And this is all free. I don't, this isn't any kind of money making idea at all. Everything is free and really looking for a a diversity of native plants. That's what the whole program is based on. And so if you do that, we'll give you a nice sign, we'll give you a certificate, the whole thing, and you'll be mapped out with a little blue jay head. So, and, and so, um, and that's what we're really trying to do here is really, really trying to connect those areas, bring it all home, change the whole concept of suburbia, bring back the ecology of suburbia. And if you're a birder and we're talking about birds here, you know, it, we live on an amazing place. 
right here in New Jersey. This, this is uh, one of the best places for birds in, in the country. Probably number four or five as far as a number of bird species that you could see. You know, you can go to many other states, you're gonna see more birds here and why? We live on the Atlantic Flyway, uh, the migration stopover, and all those different habitats in between there just makes it a, a just amazing place. And right here, I am in Bergen County, most populous uh, county in New Jersey, highly fragmented. And so this is a way that we can, that we could really honestly kind of make up for what we've been losing. And of course, you know, when we think about Audubon, we think about birds, of course, but you know what? Um, um, the uh, animals can't reach signs. So whether it's a butterfly garden or a bird garden, whatever you want to create, it's going to help everything in that ecosystem. So there's four elements of, of a wildlife habitat uh, that you want to think of, really. Uh, food, water, shelter, and nesting places. And there are different ways that we could really help uh, help improve those areas in our backyard. Just basic goals, of course, increase the native plantings, uh, add to that biodiversity, add to the available food and water sources, shelter, nesting opportunities that we'll talk about, and of course, decrease the non-native and invasive plants, the lawn size of pesticides. We're changing the whole concept. If there's anything, when I do this program, what I really ask people to do is think differently. When you leave here, when you, when you turn off the computer and, and you look outside your window, I hope you get a totally different concept of what you're looking at and the possibilities and what it is and how many birds and wildlife will depend on that, that area right outside your window. So uh, in, in uh, ornithology, there's something called stratification. Uh, habitat is like a four layer cake. Uh, and birds will use and wildlife will use those different levels of the canopy. So ideally, ideally now I say you, you try to improve each layer of that habitat. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, you, if, if you have a, a total shade garden that you don't, you cut down trees, absolutely not. You use the kind of habitat that you're in. And we certified everything from small backyard butterfly gardens to acreage of, of forest land that's been restored. So you work with what you have and you can improve any kind of habitat that you have. So I know I'm preaching to the choir, but you know, why native plants? Well, you know, they evolve forever together. They depend on each other. Everything gets everything at the right time, that whether it's the seeds, the insects, the berries, everything is timed perfectly uh, for all our wildlife. Obviously they require less watering and use less fertilizer because nobody's running around the woods with bags of fertilizer, but they really do really well, of course. So uh, native plants are better for birds. There's four native plant uh, uh, groups, food groups, of course. There's berries and fruits that we know about. And look, those native plant berries, they're, they're, they're specific. They're not just any berry. They got the right nutritional value at exactly the right time that our wildlife needs them. That's something, you know, so you can't just, well, I got a berry bush out there and I think it's okay. It's really, the, again, you got to remember, they evolved each other for eons. Nuts and seeds, absolutely important. Nectar, of course, things like our wonderful hummingbirds. And what's the next, the big one? You guys know what that is. Insects, right? 96% of land birds feed insects to their chicks. They're not feeding, if you have bird feeders out, they're not feeding seed to their not young. They're not, you know, you know this, this is what they need. So you could have a lush, beautiful yard to the eye, but really it could be just a total wasteland. A friend of mine compares it to uh, uh, invasive plants or non-native plants. If you go into a shop, right, and, every, and you're hungry and everything looks cool, and then you walk up to the produce aisle and all the food is plastic. Well, that's kind of what having your yard full of non-native and invasive plants are. It might as well be plastic for the birds because it's not producing the insects that these birds need to survive. And nesting chickadees, look at those numbers of caterpillars. <laughs> for 9,000 caterpillars before they flitch. You know, I, I got the opportunity uh, a few years back just to sit in a backyard and watch a Baltimore Oriole from sunup to sundown bringing insects to its nest. And, and it was literally sun up to sundown with no rest, back and forth, back and forth all day long. If those insects aren't there, if those plants aren't there, 
to provide food for those insects, then our birds are no longer there. And that runs right down to everything from our, from our pollinators to butterflies, whatever it is. And I don't have to tell you guys why an invasive plant is bad. You know, and too many times I get things, well, I have uh, Japanese barberry and it doesn't travel around. It doesn't go anywhere. I have, you know, you know, if, if anybody thinks that I'd like them to come spend the spring and summers with me going to habitats and trying to get rid of this stuff from choking out a uh, habitat. So, so again, they just disrupt the habitats, re reduce any biodiversity. Uh, and so next to a bulldozer, ne next to me getting a bulldozer out and plowing over uh, a habitat, these things are really the next worst thing, or perhaps even just as bad. And so again, to change that concept of what, what we want to think, you know, if, if the insects aren't eating your plants, if something isn't eating your plants, then something isn't working. And I know that's totally different concept than, you know, I grew up, uh, uh, you know, my Italian grandmother would, if she saw holes in the leaves on a plant, she would want to get like a nuclear weapon or something and get rid of it and get rid of those, those plant, uh, holes in the plant, those insects that were eating it. But that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's when you know things are working. And just to some of the number of plants, you know, so compare something like the wild cherry. 448 species of Lepidoptera. And I'm not even talking about the cherries that are beneficial to the birds, but 440 species, as, as opposed to something like uh, a Bradford pear tree, which will get probably zero insects that could use it, zero. Um, so, and wonderful birds, we're, you know, in a month or so, we're gonna be at the height of migration where these birds like the wood thrush, they like the scarlet tanager and the warblers are coming up from Central America. They need to find that food. They need to find that food and, and, and that foods and insects that are coming from the native plants. And I, I always leave this picture of the American snout, which is probably on a hackberry tree, with those little holes in the leaves, because that's a beautiful thing. That means things are working. And probably that beautiful Canada warbler that's going to be headed here soon is probably eating the larvae or the caterpillar of that American snout. But that's how things work. When they're all in balance, it works perfectly. So again, a world without insects, again, different concept. We really are that native plants are the foundation of a real, true, healthy habitat. You can't make up for it. Now, I, 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 I totally enjoyed uh, uh, Douglas Ptolemy's book on, on the oaks, and, and, and I did hear him mention about birders who love oaks. So let me tell you that, you know, um, years and years ago, uh, when we were birding, we knew to look for oak trees. Uh, we just knew that we were out, especially in an area that may be full of invasives. We would say to each other, find the oak tree because we're going to find birds in there today. And then we started to call it the magic tree. Let's go find the magic tree, which was really the oak trees. And of course, with, with uh, Dr. Ptolemy studies now, we know why uh, 517 species of Lepidopter will use those oak trees, not even counting how important the, the uh, uh, acorns are. The birds, but it's really those insects. So that if you're a bird, find that find that oak tree during migration time, and you'll find all kinds of birds. And that's just a runoff. Again, amazing, amazing how insects compared to. I should do a rundown of all the non-natives and how how they don't attract anything. But so we can really change everything. We could change a whole a whole. Uh, dynamics of our neighborhood. You know, often I have people uh, come to me and, and say, Donna, you know, I, I, I don't see the chickadees anymore in my yard. And I, and I don't see the woodpeckers like I used to. And I, I don't know what's going on. And my first question is, okay, did you, did they cut down trees in your neighborhood? Did they cut down a lot of oak trees? Did they cut down uh, maple trees in your yard somewhere in your area? And usually they say, well, well yeah. Yeah, they did, and, and that's what happens. You, you can't maintain bird species without maintaining uh, the native plants that they need to survive. Beautiful things are, are, are these wonderful flying jewels, uh, these neotropical birds like the black-throated green, the chestnut-sided warbler will be headed here in a month or so. And we really need to create those places, those stopover points, even if they're not going to breed in your yard and many of these warbler species will be headed north but it's just like you on on vacation you're driving down the road and you got to find a rest stop right got to find a rest stop you got to eat you got to refuel 
you got to rest and you got to go on. Well, that area might be your backyard. If you're ever, if you're birding and you're out early in the morning at sunup, these birds have been traveling all night. If they don't find food, they're probably not going anywhere for good. I mean, that could be the end of them unless they're able to find that food and refuel. And that, that's why we need to create those little stopover points. Smaller trees like the service berry, you know, some of my, again, you guys know that we could have a list and list and list, but I just love the service berry number one, because I could sit there and eat them and watch the birds. But, you know, it, it's, if you have a service berry, it's the greatest lazy birders place just to sit under a service berry in June and watch things like the rose breasted gross beaks and the Orioles and the cedar wax rings and the cat birds just come in and devour those, those great little berries. And of course, our native dogwoods, the pagoda flowering dogwoods is that understory, uh, understory trees. Um, and, you know, never, never the uh, acousas, never the acousas, which really destroy the habitat. And their perfection, our, our native plants are just per perfect with the eastern red cedars, cedar wax rings, right? This is how, this is how it all goes together. American elderberries, some shrubs, we can go on and on, but native viburnums. Now you guys know, be careful when you go looking for native plants. Don't go in and just say, I, I want a viburnum because nine times out of 10, you're gonna get all kinds of either hybrids or non-native viburnum. So um, educate yourselves a little bit, learn those, learn those Latin names, the botanical names and be specific of what you go looking for. And try to have some kind of, you know, it, it, obviously most of us don't have these giant expanses of, of area, but try to put in something like uh, chokeberry or winterberry holly that will help things like the hermit thrush uh, through the winter. And of course, our native dogwood shrubs. Now, uh, native, now, and I get this all the time because we're butterfly garden, and we have many butterfly gardens, and everybody wants to plant a butterfly bush. But this is our native butterfly bush, button bush, a wonderful, just a wonderful native plant. Uh, so there's no reason that you should have to go out and buy a, a, a non native invasive uh, butterfly bush. And this guy can grow anywhere. You know, if you read about it, it says, well, it needs to grow in water. It really doesn't. I could show you places where it grows in water and I could show you places where it grows in very dry areas. So um, you could plant it anywhere and I'd say it's adaptable to just about any backyard and you get beautiful butterflies like the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. So here's the idea. If you need an example of the perfect native plant and the way they work in the environment, spice bush, right? The great, those big fat red berries on the female plant it's high fat content. And when does it get them in time for late summer and fall migration? Perfect plant. And another reason it's perfect plant because it's the host plant for the spice bush swallowtail, right? So just think, you add a couple of spice bush to your yard, look what you already did. You're helping birds on migration. You're helping spice bush swallowtails. It gets little yellow flowers that the pollinators are attracted to. You change the whole dynamic. You just improve that, that biodiversity in that small part of your yard. Now you could do this. We could do this. It's amazing. Move on to the ground layers, the, uh, the meadow layers like hyssop or agastache, and then you could see the goldfinches that look close at that picture. Let that plant go to seed and you see those little goldfinches all over pulling those seeds out. And the Joe Pie weed, where you'll get magical butterflies like that beautiful common buckeye. Now, I have to have milkweed in every yard. We can't do, talk about any kind of uh, backyard habitat, really any kind of habitat, and how important uh, having the milkweed in your yard is. And, and, you know, some people are a little afraid of milkweed or common milkweed spreads too much, but there's a milkweed, there's a milkweed species for every yard. And look, who, who doubts that that flower isn't as beautiful as, as any, any kind of other wild flower that you may want to plant. Uh, and look at it, and that actually, actually is my arm, believe it or not. So. <laughs> and it should be on, the monarch should be on the endangered species list. They really absolutely should. I think they're just politics involved and eventually they're gonna probably put it on there to help it. But, um, but you know what? The average person, we didn't wait for it to be on endangered species list. We, we knew what was happening. And, and the average person, uh, many independent groups just, just took the bull by the horns and said, we're gonna help. And, and they absolutely did. And even along the highways, this is uh, myself along with uh, 
some folks from uh, New Jersey DOT saving some milkweed right along the entrance by, uh, by the turnpike in Teaneck. And this is why milkweed is so important. And that's uh, laying eggs at our butterfly garden at Overpeck. More native wildflowers, New York ironweed, cardinal flower. Get cardinal flower and you'll get a hummingbird. I can, I can guarantee that. So keep the, keep the goldenrod, right? One of the most important flowers in, in you know, so, so we helped the monarch, right? We planted, we planted milkweed. We did our job, right? Well, no, no, because we're not done yet. We're only half done because just like birds, that habitat is becoming fragmented too much distance between habitats. And so the, the goldenrod, one of the last things to bloom and one of the things that the monarchs depend most on for that, uh, their uh, travel back to Mexico. So keep that goldenrod up, plant goldenrod. There's so many different wonderful species of goldenrod. Uh, and that's something that should be in every habitat. And you should fight to keep that up in your neighborhood and not have towns come out with the deadly weed whacker and really uh, destroy it. The asters too, uh, asters and goldenrod, uh, just uh, very important plants. And not only the asters for provide nectar for so many uh, uh, pollinator species, but that little tiny pearl crescent butterfly will lay its eggs on, its ast on the asters. Bee balm or manada, right? For, for the hummingbirds, you. You plant the bee balm and and the cardinal flower and native honeysuckle. You're gonna get those those hummingbirds in your yard. Now I gotta tell you, I live in a, I have a tiny planting area. My planting area is probably, I don't know, twelve feet wide, maybe by forty feet long, in a really an industrial part of the Meadowlands. And I get hummingbirds every year. I get hummingbirds. I have twenty species of butterflies, eighty species of birds in this tiny little habitat. So when I have somebody come to me that has acres and acres up in North Jersey and say, I never saw a hummingbird, and you're probably filled with non-native plants in your backyard. That's all I, I, I could think. Vines, just as important. The trumpet vine, right? You think a trumpet vine for the, the uh, hummingbirds, but Orioles love that trumpet vine just as much, and they go behind the flower and poke holes in it to take the nectar. Nothing else that can make up for that. And of course, you get the trumpet vine moth. See how this is all connected. Our native plants are only good for one thing, They're holding that whole ecosystem together. And uh, Virginia, creeper, of course, the native honeysuckle is gone, but you got Virginia creeper, gets berries on it, and we have the Virginia creeper sphinx moth, right? It's just the more you research and the more you learn about this, you will watch your garden really come to life. You know, it's like turning on a light in a dark room, literally. You know, um, you know, when I, I first did this kind of stuff years ago, I started planting natives in my yard. I said, okay, you know, maybe one day I'll get a hummingbird or maybe one day I'll get some butterflies. And you know what? It's like the wildlife are just waiting there for it. Just, just waiting for you to plant these stuff and, and make, you, make the whole ecosystem return. Just return that, that whole ecosystem to suburbia. Dutchman's pipe, a pipe vine is a great example of how individuals really help butterflies. Pipe vine or Dutchman's pipe was, um, you know, uh, used on porches and houses. As, as it's just an implant at the time, at probably the early 1900s. And you can probably still find it at, at uh, in different locations. Um, and that's the host plant for the pipe vine swallowtail. Well, pipe vine kind of fell out of favor Unfortunately, so did the pipe vine swallowtail, uh, where a lot of places, the only place that grew really in our area was maybe along the Palisades. Well, butterfly enthusiasts, butterfly lovers years back say, I know we can help the pipe vine and started planting pipe vine everywhere. Again, now pipe vine swallowtail is much more common in this area than it was 15 or 20 years ago. And that's our babies, that's the caterpillars. A really creepy looking alien looking uh, uh, <laughs> caterpillars from the pipe vine swallowtail, uh, but beautiful sight. That's that's our babies at our garden. Now grasses, right? You don't think it, we know? I think the importance of native uh, grasses to birds. Of course, many of the bird species that are endangered or threatened are grassland species. 
Um, so providing things like switchgrass for wonderful sparrow species like the song sparrows, but also you don't think of grasses as helping butterflies, but they do, or skipper species, Delaware skippers, Northern broken dash skippers, we can go on and on and on. Again, a great example of how that one native plant isn't only helping one thing, how it's bringing and connecting that whole ecosystem and bringing that, that uh, biodiversity back to the backyard and helping take those stresses off the of wildlife, creating that place that wasn't there. You, know, you, you will have an immediate positive impact. So many things right, that we do in the environmental movement. Boy, it's sometimes it's, you know, it's writing letters, making phone calls, holding protest signs, whatever it is. But this is one of those great empowering things that we can do. You don't have to get anybody's permission to stick a few native plants in your yard. And better than that, create a whole environment of your backyard and make the environment a better place. Fight climate change, help endangered species. Uh, and it's, it, I wish everything, everything had more answers or quicker answers than this. But this is why it's so exciting. It really is exciting uh, to me. And of course, and 94% of moth caterpillars pupate in the ground and leaf litter. We can't clean up. We can create all these beautiful native plants and whatever we want. If we're raking it up and cutting it back, you just really hurt the whole ecosystem again. So again, we have to change the way we think, change the way we garden, right? And, 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 we, and, and that's what's going to really make the difference. And obviously, we could do a whole program on just the, the life and the leaf litter and how important it is. You know, and I know, look, it, it, you, you know, you're maybe not going to be able to leave the leaves everywhere in your yard, but certainly on your garden beds and places of the yard, there are places that you could leave them. And don't be neat. It's a, it's a perfect, uh, perfect excuse not to be a, a, you know, do garden work when you don't have to. No need to clean up all the time. And, you know, so many question I get done. I don't see the lunar moths. I don't see the lightning bugs I did when I was a kid. Well, that's why, because you're throwing them out. You're raking them up and throwing them out. Bird feeders could be part of that habitat. They really don't, not really part of the, uh, uh, what we're looking for in a certification system. But if you do bird feeders, you know, just clean, keep them very clean. It's much like a pet. You wouldn't want your dog bowl or cat's dish to get dirty. So clean them out, clean under the feeders, and, and you'll, be, you'll be just fine. And the best thing that, that feeders do, really, that I find is really help connect people that otherwise wouldn't be connected to our birds. And I do serve, serve that purpose. And look, habitats are beautiful. So many questions I get, and I'll say, Don, you know, I, I can't have this wild yard of the town will get on my back. Well, there's no reason it has to be wild crazy looking it could be just as beautiful as any garden just really using it with native plants so just some basic tips if you're going to use fertilizer organic only of course no pesticides improve the soil compost is the way to go leave the leaves organic mulch if you're going to mulch you know don't I have people using rubber mulch and that kind of stuff. So always, always be organic. Now, don't be this. This guy winds up in all my programs all the time crying about something. And, you know, so if you have a groundhog or something, I'm not the guy you want to cry to because they're really just part of the deal. You know, you, you can't create these habitats without having, you know, our friends, the squirrels or the groundhogs or snakes or, and, and, and uh, reptiles and all kinds of cool things come back. So uh, just watch it happen and enjoy it. That's my, that's what I say. Enjoy them. Water sources are important, right? You know, so you think about it. Um, when we were a kid, we grew up playing by a pond, you know, we're down the street to the stream. Think about how few those places are now. They're just not there anymore. So providing some clean water doesn't have to be fancy. A clean, shallow dish of water for, for again, creating that rest stop, create that food rest stop, that, that drink rest stop. Uh, it's a great, great thing to do in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and if you go all out, you have the room to create a little pond, all the better. Uh, and, and you landscape those with natives too. So we, you have an opportunity to create all these micro habitats right in your own backyard. And just a, a heads up about, you know, creating a pond, make sure you're creating shallow areas. 
you know, if you get one of those pond kits and they drop down the sides, they be, could become bird drowners, honestly, because some horrible things happen. So slope it in with rocks so birds could walk on the rocks and get out if they have to. Uh, and uh, just uh, create that whole uh, wetland habitat right in a small area of your yard. Keep those dead snags up too, those dead trees. You know, again, we want to cut down every tree. It looks dead and a tree guy comes in and he cuts it down in the stump. Don't do that. Um, I just had a meeting with a local town where uh, with an arborist and I really urged them not, not to cut down. I, you know, they wanted to remove some trees that were near houses. Well, you don't need to remove the whole tree. Keep those dead snags up. Even if you keep 10, 15 feet of them up, if you can, five feet, if you only can, whatever you can, because they're homes for birds. They provide food for birds. You know, we have a, a housing shortage is tough enough in New Jersey for us. Well, it's tough for the birds too. So having those, keeping those dead snags up uh, is really an important part of that ecosystem. And when we can't, and putting nest boxes up is, is important too, to really take those stresses off the cavity nesting birds like chickadees, nuthatches, and titmice. So I, I, I love this photo because on the left is a little house wren. And that little house wren is nesting. You see it's bringing a little insect into the house. But on the other side is a downy woodpecker. And the downy woodpecker isn't taking sticks into the house. It's throwing the sticks out that the wren used during nesting season. So the downy's getting ready to spend the winter there. And he doesn't like the sticks in there, or that's a she actually doesn't like the sticks there. And uh, so and then when nesting season comes, the downy likes to go to the dead snag. And then the wrens come back and use that for nesting. So some good nest boxes up in your yard is really, I think, is really important a way to really help improve that habitat. And even robins, which love to nest anywhere, just a little simple uh, platform up for robins really helps. And don't forget bats. You want to clean up those insects so you spray all over. You want to kill every thing in the world. You want to uh, just cringe when I hear about the mosquitoes spraying everywhere. But help some bats, they'll, they'll clean them up for you. And so to find the native plant, you can go to uh, Audubon has plants for birds website where you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you what native plants might work in, in your area, which is great. And conservation begins at home. It, you know, it really does. Just remember that. And we're not, we're creating a great place, not only for the wildlife, but we're creating this great place. I think if we learned anything during COVID, right? If we learned anything at all, how important nature was, how important our backyards were. So I hope we never lose that. I hope, you know, out of tragedy, sometimes good things come. And uh, I, I really hope that we can remember that whether it's in our parks or wherever it is in our backyards that remember to save a place for nature wherever we are. So if you just go on uh, bergencountyaudubon.org, CWG, you can get the, um, uh, the uh, application. And again, we're really just looking for the diversity of of, of native plants. That's what we're really looking for there. We have our schoolyard, Saddlebrook School was our first school to get certified a few years back. Really proud of that. We've worked with them for many years. You want to learn about these plants in action. Uh, we have gardens up at the New Jersey Botanical Garden in Ringwood. Um, and that's been a few years. That's well established now. Uh, that's a butterfly garden, hummingbird garden we have there, Teaneck Creek. Uh, and Tina Creek's an interesting thing. You know, Tina Creek is, is um, we've been doing habitat restoration there for years, but that's an interesting county project where that's being restored uh, now. Um, of course, there was like many parts of Bergen County that used as a garbage dump at one time. So that's being remediated and they're really creating one of the first uh, suburban wetland restoration projects with a great list of native plants. So that's a very exciting project to watch uh, and see how it's going. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be back uh, in our gardens uh, there soon, but very, very exciting. If you love native plants and you, and you really uh, love what they can accomplish in suburban and ur urban areas, this is really uh, an exciting future program. Lots of our work in the Meadowlands over the years at places like the Court Park, where we put a good, good part of our, our money into restoring. You know, it's interesting when when the Court Park was made. I guess over forty years ago now, very few native plants were available, 
and, and I don't think the really full understanding of native plants was there back then. So, so they did what they could. And now it's funny, all these years later, we're in the process of removing a lot of those uh, invasive or invasive and non-native plants and restoring them with natives. But we do our butterfly uh, day there every year in July. So uh, come on out for that. And, and we've got a lot of things coming up. Of course, our place close to my heart, our, our butterfly garden, I know many of you have been to at Overpeck, uh, which is really a labor of love and uh, just a great place set up as a learning area and as a habitat restoration project. So come out and say hi this year. Uh, and all the paths you're taking life, make sure a few of them are in dirt because that's very important to all of us. So get your yard certified, you'll get a nice sign, we'll send it out to you uh, and your certificate and we'll put you on the map and, and help the birds, help the butterflies. Native Plant Day is May 15th at the Meadowlands. It's all free, come on out. Sometimes we give away native plants, but don't tell everybody. Uh, so, uh, and we'll have tables and we'll have fun and talks and walks. And so come out and join us there. And I do got to plug my book, uh, Life in the Meadowlands. Uh, you know, I'm selling it at cost. It's, I'm not making any money. I just want people to enjoy and learn to love the Meadowlands that I, I have. And that's available on uh, Amazon too for like $4.42. So pick up a copy. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and join Bergen County Audubon Society and help us continue our all our work and all our projects. Um, and so much appreciated. I, I hope I can answer some questions for you and you'll get certified. How about that? Okay, thank you very much, Don. And we have lots of questions as you um, might expect. Um, first of all, there's lots of specific questions about getting certified. So let me just mention a few of them. Do you have to be in Bergen County? No. What if, okay, what if you don't remove all your non-native plants? Okay, I'm not, you know, we were really looking on what plants that you have, you know, that, and, and so uh, we certainly would want you to remove invasive plants, but so, but we're not even looking for that on a list. We're looking for the diversity of native plants that you have. So, um, you know, so if you're if you're adding some, if you're adding that, if you're replacing the non-natives as you go with it, with uh, the natives, that's where we what we're looking at. We we want to encourage you. I'm not I'm not the non-native police. I'm not going to come to your house and say get rid of that. But but, but as as uh, I think you know, we really just want you to keep adding and have that diversity of native plants is what we're really looking for. Speaking to what you just mentioned, somebody wanted to know if if you get your garden certified by you, does that mean it's open to the public and people can have to be able to come look at it? No, 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 this is that that's your own thing. You could choose to put out your sign or not. You could just put it where you could see it, but we're giving you a sign anyway. But we just really want to document that. You know, we just want to document what areas have been restored or improved with native plants. So no, no, there's no, there's no catch to it. That's no. Okay. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's good to specify that. And again, you don't have to be in Bergen County. No, um, no. I, well, like I said, we have yards in New York state, in Missouri, believe it or not, uh, in Pennsylvania. So we're all over the place. If you go to the uh, to the website, which was put into the chat, um, the Bergen County Audubon website, and um, that information is in the chat, how you can get the forms you need to um, to do certification. Um, I know that you talked about a lot of shrubs, a lot of burying plants, but um, we still had a lot of questions about what okay. specific burying plants are good for birds. So just maybe reiterate a few of those. Yeah, you know, so... Uh... Uh, the, the dogwood shrub, silky dogwood, red twig dogwood were great. Uh, elderberries, um, but you know, and it's going to depend on what your habitat is like, which ones you use, of course, where you got sunshade, wet, dry. Uh, but spice bush is great. Um, um, let's see what else we have. Uh, native the, cherry, the, native the, cherries like um, like choke cherry and and choke berry, which is not a cherry, the erroneous. Right. Right. So you, I mean, you mentioned a lot choke of them. Berry. Yeah. So what, so what you try to do is, is like chokeberry uh, is sort of like holly. You don't really see the birds eat it until it gets cold and freezes and then they get kind of sweeter. So they become like a almost like a survival food for them. 
Um, so L the, the, the native uh, uh, viburnums uh, are great, like uh, arrowwood viburnum uh, is great. So um, yeah, so you know, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to be a plant collector. Some people end up, you know, trying just to collect a lot of different. Put in, put in what what works, what works in, works in the yard, and, and put more of those, and try to, again improve those different layers from trees to small trees to shrubs. Uh, if you're just a big open area and you want to create a meadow habitat with grasses and butterfly, that that's perfect. Whatever whatever you can do. Whatever you can do is going to help. It's really going to help. Somebody, somebody asked um, specifically, what about if you have a very small space? Yeah, well, I, like I said, I got a, or something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I got, you know, you could do a patio. <laughs> you know what? I, I find I'm experimenting all the time with native plants and big pots. You know what? And it works. I have milkweed coming back in, in, in uh, pots every year. Many uh, of uh, native uh, wildflowers and big pots on a patio. I try to utilize all parts of my yard and again i have a very small yard mm -hmm. you know you don't get much smaller than mine and and uh you know it, it works so yeah so we're looking you know again just as the group of native plants that you have that that diversity if if you put on your certification i have a 10 foot by 10 foot area and you have you know 10 of the different native plants or whatever then you're probably going to get certified, you know, because that's an important little area. I mean, you know, be a little bird passing over and you find that 10 foot area. If you're a hummingbird, you you can come to an area like that every year on, on migration. Now, hummingbirds are amazing. They come back to the same backyards almost on the same day every year. So even having that small, want to create a small hummingbird garden on the patio, you could do it. You could do it. You know, don't don't underestimate what you can do. Don't underestimate and say, you know, I can't do this. It's too small. You know, we're connecting it. We're just kind of connecting it all. So if you you say, what's your favorite nature center? Let's say your favorite nature center is the celery farm, right? Well, I want to make the celery farm bigger. Well, what do I do? I can't go out and buy all the houses around it and knock them down, even though that sounds appealing to me. <laughs> but what we can do is add habitat to those surrounding yards and schoolyards. And you know what we did? We made the salary farm bigger in some ways, right? So don't underestimate. If you do that little 10 by 10 and your neighbor does something over there and your neighbor does something down there, you know, it all adds up. And that's the whole, that's the whole concept. That's what we're trying to do here. I like to say, if you plant it, they will come. I, I, absolutely, you know what? And, and we have lots more questions. Absolutely, you know, I and I didn't, I, you know, years ago when I, I didn't, you know, I, I just know native plants were good and I just put them in the yard. Boy, if they, again, if they could find me, <laughs> they could find anybody. They could find <laughs> any of you, whoever you are. <laughs> A couple of about um, feeding. Um, is it a good, since we know that most birds need caterpillars for the young, is it a good idea to feed with mealworms? And also one more, um, is it better to replace your feeders with native plants? What's the trade-off there? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, the native plants are the most important thing. They're the foundation of the habitat, really. You know, bird feeders are, I, I think they're more entertainment, you know, I mean, they, you know, in a severe cold winter, there are some studies that say they could help the birds survive to the to the next night. Uh, but don't forget the birds, many of these neotropical birds are, are not eating seeds at all. And none of the birds are feeding the seeds to their babies. Now the babies may eat seeds after they come out of the nest. Um, but so, and again, I, I, bird feeders, I think the, the best thing that they do is connect people to nature that otherwise wouldn't be connected. You know, there's people uh, that I know that maybe can't get out of their uh, houses anymore and they sit by their window and enjoy the birds. I, I would never want to take that away from them. You know, I would never want to take that away from them. And, and, and so when a person sees a bird at their feeder that maybe a few weeks ago was in Canada or Central America, it's magical. So um, the, 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 the native plants are the foundation. You're helping the environment, you know. You're you're helping the birds, and and that that's that's much more important. Um, you know, uh, if you wanna if you 
want to put up feeders, but that doesn't, the feeders can't make up for the native plants in the yard. I can't, you know. Okay, um, specific question, how do you um, provide water without allowing mosquitoes to breed? Yeah, you'd have to change it. You know, you, you, uh, you know if it's a pond, you recirculate the water. Uh, if it's a bird bath, you just have to, it takes a few days for mosquito larvae to, to uh, form and, and you wanna change the water anyway. You wanna keep it clean anyway. So just hose it out, you know, rinse it out each day and the mosquitoes aren't gonna form. You don't want, you don't want to leave standing water there because it's unhealthy for the birds, but also unhealthy for, you know, that brings mosquitoes in. So to put a bird bath out, you just have to realize that you, you have to do some maintenance on it. You know. The um uh, I know that birders don't like to disclose locations in some cases, but um, we have a couple of questions about what are the best places to in New Jersey to see migratory birds. Oh, then, no, that, yeah, the only, the only time birders don't uh, divulge something is if you, if you're going to think they're going to harm a nesting bird. So we're probably not going to tell you where, but, you know, uh, boy, it depends where you are, really. Uh, we, you know, New Jersey is amazing. I mean, you got everywhere from Cape May to High Point and everything in between. I'm a Meadowlands guy, grew up there. I mean, I love the Meadowlands, uh, the Court Park, if you're looking for uh, you know, if you're up in northern New Jersey looking for migrating warblers, Delaware Water Gap, of course, and, and way, way on the state park. If you're in my neck of the woods, everything, the Meadowlands Celery Farm, and we have all the local nature centers, Teaneck Creek, Flat Rock Brook, Tenafly Nature Center, uh, Demarest, there's just so many. That's a wonderful thing. There's something close by to everybody here. You know, in other states, it's not that easy. It sounds funny, but some other states, you got to get in a car and travel really far to find a good, most places in New Jersey, you could walk out your door and take a, but you can be in Jersey City and Jersey City is amazing bird, birding at Liberty State Park. So, you know, it, it all depends what time of year it is, when, when you're, uh, you know, uh, out there, but join us on some walks. We do free nature walks a few times a week and we take you to some cool places to look at some great birds, but you know, I, but the answer is really particularly where exactly you live and, and where you want to go. <laughs> but it's great. It's great out there. Okay. There are, we got a couple of questions and comments about not cleaning up leaves, which I find is a difficult concept sometimes for yes. people because there somebody is saying, um, if I don't clean up my leaves, how are the plants going to grow? Things like that. So would you talk a little bit more and, about uh, the well, idea? Of well, look, nobody's leaves. raking up the leaves in the forest, but those plants are doing pretty good, right? Um, so yeah, I know it's hard, you know, I, you know, I, when I, I talk to garden clubs sometimes, you know, I think I got to bring a defibrillator and give them, shock them back to life because they're dying. When I say don't clean up, yeah. they're, they're spazzing <laughs> and crazy. It's a different concept. If it's, and that's what I mean by a total different way of thinking as the yard, as a habitat, right? I mean, obviously you don't want big piles of leaves on covering all the plants, but that, that doesn't happen, you know? Um, so it'll be fine. <laughs> Just take a <laughs> breath, you know? Take a breath and sit back and it'll be good. You know, it, it's tough. tough I'll, I'll give you an example of something I watched uh, last year that, you know, I, we have a problem with uh, aphids on milkweed or oleander aphids, which are an invasive kind of aphid, a little orange aphids. And a lot of times in the summer, I'm walking around with orange hands because I'm squishing aphids, right? Well, I'm sitting back in, in the garden one day and um, I see goldfinches going in and out of the milkweed. <laughs> And I'm saying, well, you know, what, what are the goldfinches doing in that milkweed? They eat a lot of seeds. There's no really seeds there now. And then when I watched them with my binoculars, the goldfinch were scooping up the aphids in their beaks and flying back to their nest and feeding their babies beak loads of aphids. So when you, when you sit back and relax and take a breath, these things, it all turns out, balances. It balances itself out if you give it a chance. Yeah, there's sometimes you have to intervene on certain certain things, but you know what? It it all it all works out for the better. So take a your plants are gonna live. You're gonna have much more life by leaving those leaves in there, by not cutting back stuff, you know, that's more and more lightning bugs and wonderful moth species. And sit back and, and enjoy it. Do a bio blitz in the yard. Go out one day, bring the neighbors, bring the neighborhood kids, and just look at find all the life that you can document it all from every insect to every 
butterfly and moth and bird and everything you could find and plant. And it's great fun. It, it's just great fun. And so you can compare that to what it was before you put those native plants in. Okay. Um, somebody um, asked a question about um, tropical milkweed. Yeah, it's not, it's not a good idea. You know, yeah, um, well, it's probably not as bad here as it is in the South. Uh, but, um, you know, the problem is it's really hurting monarchs in the South on migration because the milkweed isn't dying back. You know, no, uh, um, native milkweed's going to eventually die back and not, and not have the monarchs delay themselves too long. But the tropical milkweed in the South just doesn't die. It doesn't die back, which is not a good idea. And it's also a lot of questions about its its value to the monarchs as far as the toxicity to other birds. So I don't think there's, there's no really reason to plant it. Like I said, you like things in pots, you could plant uh, milkweed, you could put butterfly weed and swamp milkweed in a pot and it does, it does fine, it does fine. So I know it looks cool, but no need to do it. A couple of people asked about um, the deer resistant plants. And um, I just wanted to, before you answer, I just want to point out that there is a list of deer resistant plants on the website, on the Native Plant Society of New Jersey website, but that it does differ in different, lo different locations. Yeah. Um, so go ahead, Don. Yeah, from yard to yard, it differs. You know, <laughs> I, I think we're gonna, we're gonna have to find a way to live with these guys. Um, you know, and it's not it's not easy all the time. And in 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 forests, of course, it's destroying the understory. But I, there's not a political will out there for local towns to do much about it, and there's not much of a political will to for individuals for that matter. So we're, so we're going to have to learn how to deal with it now. And, and look, our restoration projects, whether it's over Peck or Tina Creek, there's lots of deer. There's been lots of deer, and there's some plants that. We would never put in again because the deer will eat them in a day. There's also ones that they may browse or not browse. So it's kind of a learning process. You know, I'm convinced, I'm totally unscientific, that as soon as you put a new plant in, a deer knows it and comes in and starts eating it. And I think, and you can have the same species of plant right next to it, and they got to come and eat the new one. And I think sometimes they're attracted to the human scent on these things. They're just so curious. Uh, it's weird. But so if it's a plant to get it going, you know, sometimes we'll cage it up just to give it a shot. If it's a shrub, cage it up at first. Let it, let it get established, then pull the cage off. Um, for instance, we, you know, um, purple coneflower. I mean, not that it's native to New Jersey, but still a great native plant. It's deer candy. You know, we, we would never just waste our money on using it in places. You're just going to eat it like from day one. So you kind of look, you know, if you stick with things that are more uh, in a minty kind of family, aromatic, they tend to stay away from. And you hide plants, too. We, we found that good. Hide plants that the deer like with, with surrounded by things like mountain mint. That works. And, and uh, things like uh, obedient plant, which they tend to stay away from. So... It's kind of a learning process. Go with stuff that is more deer resistant, but you know, sometimes they're gonna eat stuff in my yard and they don't never touch it in a yard in another town. So, um, but, and, and plant a little bigger, you know, is what we do. We spend a little more money on a project and, and put, try to put in a little bigger shrubs and trees rather than putting in something small that the deer eat to the ground, so. It's not easy, you know, but just don't get frustrated. You could do it and, and you'll, you'll learn what you can and can't do in your yard. I wish I had a better answer for you from that. But but again, if we could, you know, people say to me, well, how do you put plants in at all these places? Don't the deer destroy it? Obviously not. They're doing, they're doing well. So it's kind of learning. It's a learning process and it, you can get frustrated, but, um, you know, just, uh, just do what you can and, and, and learn what you think the deer will do and, and not do. And a couple of people are asking about um, materials. If they would like to go do presentations to schools or to their town council, um, does Bergen Audubon have any materials that you can share or where can you get materials like that? We, we do have like handouts on, on, the, uh, on the garden certified garden program we do have on our website to download a list of native plants but we don't have necessarily a full-blown uh, 
which is probably a good thing that we should probably have, uh, is to go and that you could lay out in front of the schools and what, what they can do. Um, you know, you could find a lot of some of that information on, on National Audubon, the Plants for Birds is a good resource. And I'm sure, you know, uh, you guys, uh, Native Plant Society will have enough, uh, stuff for them, but we can give you anything that you might need on, on for information on the, uh, on the certification program. We'd be happy to send you some or, or give it whatever you need. Um, thank you. Just one very specific question, which is how high to put a nest box? What's yeah, the, depends, what height you should put a nest yeah, box? Yeah, it depends on the species. So you match the species, you match the box and the with the habitat that you're in, right? So you could buy a bluebird box, but it doesn't mean you're going to get bluebirds unless you have the right habitat, which would be big open fields. So it, on average, if you're going to put up a chickadee or a house wren box, which are what most people are doing in the average backyard. If you get those five or six feet up, that's fine. You know, if you're going to talk about getting a screech owl box up, then that's higher. You want to go probably 10 feet or so. Uh, when you get into the woodpeckers like flickers or, uh, or hairy woodpeckers, you want to go up pretty high to maybe 10, 15 feet if you can. I mean, look, you know, birds don't go out with tape measures either. You know, I've seen chickadees nesting in, in uh, tree cavities that were knee high. So it happens. Uh, but but on average, I'd say if you get a, a chickadee or house wren box up about five or six feet, you're doing okay. And they could be in woods edged area or back in the woods a little more. When you're talking about flickers and woodpeckers, you want it in a more heavily treed area than, than a big open area. So you know, learn what bird that might be in your area and what kind of habitat it likes and kind of put that box in the habitat in the area that is most conducive to that species. Okay, I think I think that's it. I mean, there are lots and lots of questions that are maybe very specific or not exactly appropriate for this for this presentation. <laughs> but I thank everybody who who asked questions, and I thank you, Don, very very much. Always informative, and always your passion always comes through. It's wonderful. So thank you very much. Hey, everybody can email. Send that. me an email. You know where I am. You know, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Anything mm -hmm. I didn't answer yeah. for you, just let me know. And again, if you had a specific question that we didn't get to, um, you might want to start by looking at uh, Bergen Audubon's website, at the Native Plant Society of New Jersey's website, at Jersey Friendly, at um, NABA, the North American Butterfly Association, and at the Xerces Society. Those right. are all really good places to um, answer really specific questions about, about right. um, native gardens and wildlife gardens. So thank you, Don. Thanks. I hope to see you all on Native Plant Day in May and come out and join us on some walks. We'll have some fun. We'll be there. Our chapter will be there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Appreciate the invite. Thank you very much, Don. That was terrific. And 